How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening or watching DNA Today. We are a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I'm also a certified genetic counselor practicing in the prenatal space. On this show, if you've listened or watched before, you know we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics like genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, and patient advocates. And I'm excited to share that this episode marks our 150th episode. So huge thank you to all our loyal listeners for getting us to this point. This is certainly a landmark, and we really appreciate all of your support since the beginning in 2012. So next year's 10 years. Um, And thank you again to our sponsors for supporting the show and really keeping us running. Want to become a genetic counselor? Looking for ways to engage with the field and boost your resume for grad school applications? Then you should check out Sarah Lawrence's Why Genetic Counseling Wednesday Summer Series. Every Wednesday this June, Sarah Lawrence is hosting the series where you can interact through Zoom with genetic counselors from different specialties for an hour and a half. It kicks off on June 2nd. You can sign up at slc.edu slash DNA today. Again, visit slc.edu slash DNA today to register to level up your resume for applications in the fall. So today we are going to be celebrating the show by talking to Dr. Ewan Ashley, a medical geneticist and cardiologist, and Dr. Stephen Quake, a physics professor, bioengineer, and pioneer in microfluidics. So I want to start out by saying I read the um, book, Dr. Ashley, that you wrote um, called The Genome Odyssey, and it was such a fantastic read. Dr. Quake and I were kind of just talking about how great of a writer you are uh, before we hopped on the call here and that it really reads like a story. So I just wanted to thank you for writing such an engaging book that really goes through just the, the history that we're going to talk about between you two and your really special project, but also just really cool cases that you've brought up um and really honoring like the patient perspective and patient advocacy so um just fantastic job with the book i'm excited to get into part of it today well thanks so much kira and i really it's very kind of you to say and i you know i'm really inspired by the the kinds of scientific stories that uh steve leads day in day out and also by just the lives and the journeys of our patients and so I, i hope to try and tell those and interweave them as they connect and i'm excited to yeah chat a little bit more about them with you today So a little background for those that maybe haven't read the book yet. Um, Back in 2010, Dr. Ashley, you led the team that carried out the first clinical interpretation of a human genome, or at least one of the first. Um, And that genome was Dr. Quake's. How did that come to be? How did you end up coming together? What was it about Dr. Quake's genome that you were like, well, I think that this would be a good one to explore and, and dive into? Well, it wasn't planned, actually. I mean, I, basically, we were meeting one day about something else. We didn't know each other that well, to be honest, at the time. And we, I was, you know, just, just meeting, trying to plan a little seminar, I think it was. And I I wound my way around Stanford to try to get myself to Steve's office and then found him in there surrounded by journals, uh, as as we see him today, actually. Uh, for those yeah. of you who are watching <laughs> online, just, just right there. And I sat myself on one of those chairs in the back, and we started talking about the seminar. But before we even really got to that, he's like, "Here, come over. Look at look at this on the screen." And on the screen, I saw one of these old HTML tables, you know, like an early website, and a bunch of A's, T's, you know, letters I recognize, A's, T's, G's, and C's, and a bunch of gene names. And I'm like, "Okay, that's genetic data." And he's and I'm like, "Well, what is that?" And he's like, "Well, that's my genome." And I, you know, at some level, I was aware that he had been. I think the fifth person in the world to have his genome sequenced and he'd he'd done it as I'm sure he'll tell us in a few minutes, you know, with the sequencing technology of his own invention. I I, I knew that, Uh, but, but here it was right in front of me. And as a practicing cardiovascular geneticist, essentially, I I would, I would be sending genetic tests at the time for three, four genes. They take three months to come back $5,000. The idea that there'd be a whole genome in front of me was was just kind of a a little bit mind-blowing so it was really after we started to look at some of those gene specific ones together and i realized that uh, maybe i should be asking a little about his cardiovascular history and he started to share that that the whole conversation moved it went from hey look we're having a scientific collaborator meeting to maybe more of a doctor patient kind of thing and i remember him saying at the time you know it's it's funny you should you should talk about this because my my family have been trying to get me to go see a cardiologist and it was really i think in that moment that we realized that as a result of the family history and i'm sure he'll share uh he should come and, and be 
be seen in the clinic. Um, and then it was a kind of secondary thought, wait a minute, someone is about to come into our clinic who has their whole genome. And that was just a mind blowing thing. And the genome was like right there in front of us on the screen. And so that's kind of how it came about really by, by happenstance in, in many ways, but in other ways, you know, maybe it, it was meant to be. And Dr. Quick, what led you to say, I'm going to sequence my genome? I mean, this was 2009. This was unheard of back then, um, which like 10 years is ancient history, I feel like, in, in genetics in terms of where we are today. Um, what were you thinking about when you were like, I, I want to sequence my genome? Well, part of my research program had been to try to develop novel sequencing technologies. And we had developed the first single molecule DNA sequencer and um, it had left my lab. We'd done a proof of principle experiment in the lab and it had left the lab and gone into a company and they had turned it, big, very talented team of people had turned that into a real commercial instrument, which was at the time the world's fastest, cheapest sequencer. Um, and there was a lot of debate about whether you could use it to sequence a human genome or not because of arguments about technical limitations, read length and error rates and things like that. And it wasn't at all obvious that even though it could sequence a lot of DNA and do it really fast and inexpensively, that it could do it on something the scale of a human genome. And you know, rather than kind of argue with people about it, I just decided we're going to do it. Um, and we'll just do the experiment um, and decided to do my genome um, in part because you know, I didn't feel right asking someone else, let's put it that way. There were a lot of unknowns about um, uh, about what that would mean and, you know, who's really in a position to give informed consent, you know, given that we don't know what the implications will be for people's health care and whatnot. And I seemed like, all right, this is one uh, I'll do myself and see what's there. And you had met with a genetic counselor before... Dr. Ashley was assembling a team to actually analyze and take it to the next level in terms of looking at your genome. I mean, how was that process? Because you're probably more educated than the average patient seeing a genetic counselor. So did that feel different kind of being in the patient role? Well, she was appalled because you know, I wasn't just in the patient role. I was in the scientist analyst role as well as, as the group was trying to um, decide, you know, what the conclusions were in the clinical annotation. Some of that hinged on what one knew about genes, and some of it hinged on what our confidence was in calling polymorphisms in the genome. And I was like the expert in the room who knew about the confidence uh, in the genome and, you know, how much emphasis believed to put on it. And that's certainly not the way she was used to doing things. There were moments when her head was in her hands because, you know, it wasn't a textbook example of genetic counseling, let's put it that way. Yeah, certainly of her just thinking of like what what could come up, you know, as we were saying, you're like the fifth person in the world that had their genome sequence. So most things we did not know what to anticipate. Was there anything before launching into the project that you were hesitant to learn about? Is there anything that you said, this is something I may not want to know about my genome? Or were you more on the sense of we're being a pioneer here and we're just going to find out what we're going to find out? Yeah, no, I mean, for me, I was happy to learn anything it would tell me. I was very curious about the contents, good or bad. And so... You know, there was no hesitation there. And the, 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 the moments of pause or the hesitation were around, you know, does this mean I might lose my health insurance because of something we discover? And am I going to have to deal with that? It was sort of more sort of practical consequences of, of, of the way we do things in society. But, you know, as far as the information and what it would tell me about my health and, and potential future, I was very, very curious about that. And I wanted to know everything, good or bad. And going back to that first time, uh, Dr. Ashley, when you were in, in the office and you're looking at this crazy spreadsheet with all these ATs, GCs, um, what genes stuck out to you in terms of maybe having information that could be really useful in terms of Dr. Quake's health and just, you know, coming from that cardiologist perspective? Yeah, well, I remember it specifically because I saw the gene myosin binding protein C, and that is a gene that causes a condition known as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be associated with uh, bad heart rhythms, VT was one example, ventricular tachycardia, and even sudden death. And so, you know, I saw this variant, and I know we all have variants, but, you know, I, I recognize the gene. So uh, that's when I started to dig a bit deeper into his family history of cardiovascular disease. And he said, well, my dad has, you know, nobody ever remembers their heart, their family history, you know, <laughs> you, you know, this is a genetic counselor. And, but at so the beginning, he's like, yeah, I don't think there's any history. And then he said, well, wait a minute, my dad has this rhythm, ventricular or something, and then I, uh, you know, ventricular tachycardia. He's like, yeah, that's it. 
And then, I, you know, I asked if anyone had ever died suddenly in his family, because that's the most important question when we're, we're taking a history for these conditions. And he said, well, yeah, my, my cousin's son uh, died suddenly, a 19-year-old with no prior family history of, of anything, no prior medical history. And that just kind of stopped us in our tracks, and, and really the, the whole thing changed at that point. And so a lot of our early focus in analyzing his genome was looking at mice and binding protein C specifically. Fortunately, that variant turned out not to be uh, causative uh, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we, we brought him to the clinic and also screened him. Uh, we pulled in a few favors to get to, we put him on a, not a treadmill, a bike. We, we exercised him. You know, doctors are fun friends to have. We exercised him pretty hard, uh, but he came through very well, I, I'm happy to say. Um, so on those those genes, uh, we were okay, but we did find some pretty important cardiovascular uh, gene findings related mostly to cholesterol uh, and coronary artery disease risk, actually, rather than um, the Mendelian condition, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we, we dug into those in a bit more detail over the course of the following few months. And so with that new information, was there anything you learned from his genome that then changed medical management or anything that led directly to that that you would not have known or done not having that genome sequenced? Yeah, I think this is one of the key things for us in, in that we, we find his, his uh, and this is all public, he's, he's shared this for many years. So I figured uh, at this point it's in the book, now we're talking about it on the show publicly. <laughs> so I think so Dr. Craig's consented at this point, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but his, his LP little a, one of the uh, lipoproteins, it's like a, a bad cholesterol particle, was particularly high. And the genetic basis for that had been shown by some folks uh, at Oxford a few years before. And we, so we mapped that. We also mapped uh, some other col uh, cholesterol and coronary artery disease risk genes and then looked at the pharmacogenomic variants for the, the medicine that you would take to, to treat that, which is a cholesterol medicine called a statin. And so then we actually went to the regular old, uh, how would we do this if we didn't have a genome? And, and we, we worked through his age, his cholesterol, all, all that uh, through this tree. And at the end, it had this really useful um, you know, end point, which was use clinical judgment. I mean, he was basically in the middle. It didn't give any advice at all. And what it was basically saying to us was, well, do you have any other information to help decide? Like, is the patient really risk averse? Or are they really eager to reduce their cholesterol? Or do you have any other information? We were like, well, hmm maybe a genome perhaps. And so, you know, so we basically looked into the genome and, and really came together with the clinical team to say, here's the extra information we have. And using that, uh, we were pretty clear that his risk was, was such uh, and his benefit would be such that he should take cholesterol lowering medication. And then Dr. Quake, did this lead to any of your other family members to be tested or provide them extra information that because you sequenced your own genome, it didn't just help you, but other family members as other medical aspects came up for them? Well, it's pretty interesting. My wife, uh, very much into genetic privacy, and she said, well, since you've had your genome not only sequenced but published, I'm not doing anything with mine, so at least half of our children's genome will remain. That seems like a good rule but, to live by. Uh, that was her take on it. Um, the more serious one was was the case that you had mentioned that my, my cousin's son had died as a teenager suddenly at night, you know, healthy in every other respect, sudden death, and they were obviously very traumatized by that and, you know, wanted to understand the cause if they could, want to understand if their daughter was at risk of anything and, you know, there's something they should be doing proactively. Um, so I introduced him to you and, and, and he took that on as, as a second study, which is also discussed in the book. And so with all of this information, I mean, looking at the genome, when this was 10 years ago, there are a lot of spelling differences or variants as we call them that maybe were not as well understood at that point as they are today. Um, when you were going through the genome, how were you able to figure out like if a genetic change was just human diversity and doesn't affect uh, human body versus being a problem, like a pathogenic variant. How is it to actually go through and categorize all of these spelling changes? I don't know. I imagine you both had a role in this. Yeah, I mean, it was really a different world from the one we live in now, uh, where we have access to hundreds of thousands of population samples to say, and even increasingly diverse population samples, not as far as we need to go there. But it's increasingly the case that we can look to very large numbers of samples to see what's the population frequency of this particular variant, the spelling change, so that we know if it was a common variant, it's unlikely to be a, a major cause uh, of, of a rare disease. But at the time, you're right, we didn't have any of that. In fact, I remember while we were doing this, I think maybe there were 10 genomes released by someone else, you know, further down the line, 
you know, the next 10 from the first after the first five. And that was a major advance to get to 10. And so we're nowhere near the hundreds of thousands and uh, eventually millions that we're heading towards. So we had to build algorithms based on ba you know, fundamental knowledge of the genome. This causes a stop code on this would mess up splicing. And this wasn't new information, but it hadn't really been applied at this scale before. We had to try to say, well, how do we take those uh, algorithms and that understanding of basic machinery uh, of, of the cell and, and apply it at the level of a data set that, that's the size of a, a whole genome. And so, yeah, that was very much a collaboration with, with Steve's group and then uh, the algorithms uh, group on our side. How do you keep research articles organized? I've struggled with this as a student for years and now as a genetic counselor, I have so many papers saved on my Mac, but it's often hard to find one and even harder to cite when I'm writing. I finally found a solution though. It's simple and easy. It's called Paper Pile. The goal of Paper Pile is to radically simplify the workflow of collecting, managing, and writing papers. This app allows you to highlight and annotate papers, manage references, share and collaborate, and get this even site directly in Google Docs. I wish I had discovered this when I was doing my thesis, would have saved me hours of time and frustrations. At every step, Paper Pile aims to provide a just work solution that eliminates any unnecessary complexity. Especially with Paper Pile's new mobile apps, you can sync your library to all your devices so you can read and annotate on your iPad, iPhone, or Android devices. So if you're a student, researcher, writer, really anyone who's downloading and reading papers, you got to check out Paper Pile for a streamlined approach. You can start your 30-day trial at paperpile.com with code DNA today. Paper Pile costs only $36 per year, but with code DNA today, you save 20%. Again, that's paperpile.com for all your papers in one place, nice and tidy. And so I think at one point, I don't know if it was a Dr. Quake's genome or another patient, um, but there was a, a change in the variant and you were trying to figure out, well, is this change pathogenic, even though we're seeing it in those other genomes that were serving as the reference genome? And, you know, you're going on this odyssey of trying to figure out like, okay, just because it's in the reference genome doesn't mean it's normal. I imagine we're experiencing less of that now that we have so many, but I mean, how was that process? Like who, who was thinking of, oh, maybe it's, it is a pathogenic variant in that reference genome. How did that process all kind of unfold? Yeah, I mean, initially it folded around, uh, unfolded around a, a family that we we dealt with after Steve. The the West family had was one of the first to sequence their genomes on uh, the Illumina platform, part of the initial ten genomes on that platform. And the only thing we knew about John West's genome at the time was that he'd been previously tested for Factor V Leiden, and that he was found to have that variant in heterozygous form. And so. We first went looking through, we had a whole family of genomes now, and we first went looking for that one change, and we found that it wasn't there, or rather, you know, a different variant was there, and so we were really confused, and that led us down a big rabbit hole that I talk about in the book that took us to Buffalo and New York and the, the beginning of the human genome program and where the reference sequence really came from and, and how some part of it links to a, a Dutch scientist who was making the reference genome. And uh, the Le Leiden, of course, from, from Netherlands and where this, this variant was first described is particularly common in that population. And we found that, of course, because it came from real people, the human reference actually had some pathogenic uh, variation in it. And that was something we had to start to account for uh, going forward. So, yeah, it was really a bit, thinking back, as, as you said, it's like it's only 10 years ago, but it's a com completely different world from the one we live in today. Yeah, and another aspect that's changed so much is just the cost of sequencing and how long it takes to do a sequence. Um, Dr. Quake, how long did it take you to sequence your genome and, and do mind sharing like how much that ended up costing and how did that compare to other people that were doing the first four, I guess, genome sequences? Yeah, so we did it over the course of roughly a month and you know each run was, was about a week and I think we did four runs total, if I recall correctly. And it ended up costing $50,000, which was 10 times cheaper than any other genome that had been done up to that point um, in terms of just the reagent cost, never mind the number of people involved. We only had uh, three authors on the paper. Um, one of them did the sequencing, one of them did the computation, and there was me. <laughs> um, whereas before, it had been like, you know, dozens of authors on a paper, and the amount of man and woman power that went into doing these things was just enormous. And so we'd really... Our work marked the first time that this had transitioned from giant factory level stuff to something a single investigator in a lab could do on their own, um, essentially. Uh, and that was very important for the field because it was a real, I think, democratizing point for the technology and meant that 
anybody who's interested in questions about genome could start playing in that sandbox. Whereas prior to that, it had been the province of a very small number of huge centers, funded centers and big hierarchical thing. Yeah, it got to the point where you're showing that it could be a small team that's achieving this and like the, really that first step towards anybody having their genome sequenced. And that's kind of at the point where we are today. I don't know, maybe that, maybe I'm overstepping a little bit. Maybe not everybody getting their genome sequenced, but there is that ability there. And Dr. Ashley, I, I love your analogy with the Ferrari. Would you mind sharing that in terms of looking at the cost of genome sequencing and, and how that's fallen over the years? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and, and this came about because I used to, to drive home from Stanford Hospital past the Ferrari garage, <laughs> garage in, uh, you know, in Atherton, which is where the, the, the Silicon Valley billionaires live. So they need a Ferrari garage nearby. And uh, I would sit at the stoplight and look at these cars that I you know, had uh, thought about since I was a little kid. Of course, they were uh, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. And like many scientists, I, I do mental math in my head while I'm driving home in at idle moments. And I, you know, all of us, Steve and me and many, many others have been showing this graph of the decrease in cost of sequencing. And he just described how his was, you know, tenfold cheaper than the one before. Um, and people were a little bit, I don't know, somehow they'd become immune to the, to what that really meant, the steep down downhill curve on a graph. And so I think prior to one talk, I thought, you know, maybe I can put this in, in more tangible format, you know, instead of Ferrari dollars. And thinking of the Human Genome Program being a few billion dollars down to where we are today, or at least at that time, uh, I, I realized that if a Ferrari had dropped in cost as much as human genome sequencing had dropped in cost, it would have dropped to around 40 cents. Uh, just, you know, mind-blowing, mind you know, change, really unprecedented in technology. And, you know, I've revised that number all the way down. I think when I even wrote the book, it was like 20 cents. And, and now, depending on which number you take, it's it's almost one cent, depending on where you, where you start. So just a, you know, a really spectacular change that has really now fueled a, a magnificent uh, change in how we approach genomic data for patients. I think that's such an easy way to understand just the magnitude of like how much it has dropped because you can look at the chart and, and try to appreciate it that way. And I think people that are very math focused can appreciate it that way. And then the rest of the population can be like, wow, you're talking about a couple cents for a Ferrari. Like that is a huge right. difference. Um, and in terms of like where we are today, um, you know, you have this great quote in the book that says, I realize he, meaning Dr. Quake, was about to become the first patient in the world to walk into a doctor's office for a checkup with his genome. And now this is the case where people do come in to their doctor and either they've had genetic testing or they've had like their full genome sequenced or maybe their exome um, and different levels of that. Where are we today in terms of like how many patients are doing this and how do you see that changing in, in the next few years? Or do you see a point where this is gonna become almost like the new newborn screening where everybody's gonna have their genome sequenced? Yeah, I think, you know, our initial thought was that this is gonna be everywhere. The once it gets cheap enough, everyone's gonna have their genome sequenced. And of course it didn't quite work out exactly like that. And I think maybe a year or two after we did this, if you'd asked me what progress we'd made, I think you might have, I'd have probably told you I was a bit disappointed in how fast and how far we'd come because everyone wants it to happen now. But then if you take a 10 year view and look back on how far we've come in 10 years, it, it's, it's mind blowing that we moved from the point where it was just unheard of to have a genome. This was like one, you know, five people in the world. And we've moved to the point now where ordering it, at least in, in, in clinical setting, is basically routine in, in most countries in the world. I mean, it's not as available as it should be. There's still challenges with pairs in certain places. But the value of the genome for genetic disease is really just not in question anymore. And, and it's, it's available. And we are certainly on a daily basis dealing with patients uh, who have their gen full genome uh, data, either, as you say, through exome or, or full genome sequencing. In fact, through our undiagnosed diseases network program that I also talk about in the, in the book, uh, you know, we we sequence not just an individual, but as they come in the door, we also sequence their family. So we sequence two to three, maybe even four individuals in a family to help make the diagnosis as, as they come in. So that's a, a sea change that was just, uh, you know, uh, beyond our, our wildest dreams, I think, when we first started. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective to have in terms of just the last 10 years. I can't imagine what the next 10 years are going to bring. Um, yeah. And Dr. Quake, have you revisited your genome in terms of, you know, we've talked a couple times now about just understanding more and more variants as time has gone on. Have you gone back on a regular basis just to check in if there are variants that have now, as we say, reclassified of understanding that maybe the impact on our health is a little bit different than we thought years ago? 
That's a really good suggestion. I think I should visit my cardiologist now. Maybe, maybe we can get you on the on uh, Dr. Ashley's schedule, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see if I have time in my schedule. To, to do that. It might be a long wait. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe he can move you yeah. up on the schedule. <laughs> can we get the old band back together? Do we have thirty-five yeah. people? Seems like you might want so. to. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. You got to write a sequel, right? So there's got to be something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. This is true. This is a good point. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I highly recommend checking out the Genome Odyssey to dive deeper into. You know, the conversation we're having today, there is just so much more in the book, and it is such an easy read. I think sometimes genetic books can be tough to get through, and I have to say this one I really, really enjoyed, and I was a little sad when it was over because there was just so many great, captivating stories in there, and it's in that format, so it's such an easy read. Um, and I especially recommend it if you're intrigued by the heart because Dr. Ashley is, is quite the nerd when it comes to how the heart works and just so captivated by it that I was like, I need to start learning more about cardiology. I think it's such an interesting field and you really, you really highlight that and bring the enthusiasm. And I'm excited to say that we're going to be doing a book giveaway. So head over to our social media on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook to connect with us and you can enter the giveaway on there. Um, and any questions for the three of us, you can send into info at dnapodcast.com. All of our episodes are available at dnapodcast.com. And I just want to thank both of you so much for coming on and, and sharing all of your insight and really pioneering genome sequencing and how we're actually using that in the clinic. It's just, it's fantastic to, you know, there's our 150th episode, but really to be able to look back on the last 10 years of genomic sequencing. So thank you so much for coming on the show and just sharing all this knowledge with the world. Thank you, Kira. Thanks for holding chat. Yeah. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. If you're applying to genetic counseling grad schools in the near future, I highly recommend checking out Sarah Lawrence's Why Genetic Counseling Wednesday Summer Series. This is the second year Sarah Lawrence will be hosting the series, where you can interact through Zoom with genetic counselors from different specialties for an hour and a half. This takes place every Wednesday in June at 12 p.m. Eastern. As many of you know, I graduated from Sarah Lawrence's program last year, and this series was a fun way to interact with prospective genetic counseling students. It was so cool to meet so many of you in the prenatal installment earlier in the month. Myself and other prenatal genetic counselors shared about our roles and answered your very thought-provoking questions live. There are still a few sessions left though. Not only will you hear from genetic counselors in a variety of specialties, You'll also have the opportunity to discuss ethical and social implications of genomic medicine, engage with current students, and learn about the exciting present and projected future of the profession. Anyone who attends all five will earn a certificate of completion and receive an application fee waiver. Register now before we are fully booked because we had really, really booked sessions earlier. Go to slc.edu slash DNA today. Again, that's slc edu slash DNA today to be part of this interactive genetic counseling experience. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.